Okay. Thank you, Jared. Uh, so, as advertised, I'm Chris Wiggins, and uh, I my talk was also to be determined until last Friday night when I ran into Jared at a bar, and I said, Jared, what should I talk about? And he gave me a few options, and I thought, well, I haven't talked about engagement, so uh, let's talk about engagement. It all happens at a bar. In New York City, in the data science community, it's, it's useful to be found in a bar. Uh, so, yeah, so I thought I would tell you some things I've been thinking about lately around engagement and how it relates to data. And if you'd like to um, look at the references from this talk, I, I made a little gist full of uh, references. And if you'd like to tweet at me if you like the talk, there's my uh, Twitter handle. Um, so briefly put, um, you might think about the New York Times the way that it's been since 1851. So 1851 was the first edition of the New York Times. It's an old company. And uh, in 1996, actually on my birthday in 1996, they released a website and they reported on it with the quaint headline, the New York Times introduces a website. And everything changed thereafter. Uh, and it's been a very interesting year, as we all know, since the World Wide Web happened. Uh, and now in 2015, the website gets millions of views every hour and there's millions of people subscribing, and uh, there's actually a, an abundance of data produced by the fact that the New York Times is now a digital property rather than a hard copy property. Um, and it's really these sorts of data that I'm most interested in trying to make sense of. So um, there was a mindset uh, change in many digital properties over the last couple of decades. So it's 1996 when the New York Times launched a website. The idea was basically that the website would be the online presence in a different um, manner of communicating with the world. But as you all appreciate, uh, distribution digitally, for example, by World Wide Web, is different than distribution by, say, a television or a radio, in that a radio sits there passively and receives photons and does something with it, whereas every digital interaction is actually a, a transaction, a communication. Your web browser actually goes to the New York Times, sends a message saying what it wants to request, and that comes back. And at the website, there's a record of that also true for your phone and every other digital transaction, which means it's not just an online presence, it's also a microscope into your users, if you so choose to look. Uh, there's an abundance of data about the way people use your product when your product is a digital product. It's also, people are starting to realize, an um, experimental tool, uh, which I think somebody covered this morning. Um, it's a way to sort of understand how you can make things different, and in fact, how to make things better. The website is also an optimization tool. So that's been a change in mindset, right? Like the change in tool set was in 1996 when uh, a website was introduced. And what's happened more recently is a change in mindset about the way that creating a digital presence allows you to listen to your customers at scale. And that's what we are trying to do in my group. Uh, so where is my group? Um, when you think about newspaper companies, generally you think about them in terms of having a strong church-state separation. Church is where the people who have the craft of journalism there, and the, the church is the raison d'etre. State is where the business side is, things like advertising. And there are very good reasons for keeping church and state separate, um, as illustrated, for example, by the Telegraph last month, which with an abundance of stories around HSBC, uh, which The Guardian took them to task for, um, or in BuzzFeed over the last week, uh, where Gawker has been sort of serving as their public editor, taking them to task for the way that they did not quite delineate between church and state. That's the way it's been for several centuries, and the way it is now for the 21st century is that there's church, state, and engineering, and engineering is what makes both of them go. Uh, and it's very nice to be in engineering, and within the New York Times, within the engineering group, there's a data science and engineering group, and within that, there's a data science group, and we have the ability, as John Tukey said, to play in everyone else's backyard. Uh, so and the data science group has been working with People in the newsroom, people in advertising, people in marketing, people in product, um, trying in general, people in print, trying in general to learn from the data that the New York Times produces in the course of daily operations and to um, not go out of business and thereby to save democracy. So um, what are the types of problems we work on in the data science group? Well, one of the things I talked about last year when Jared invited me, thank you again, Jared, was trying to understand the way that our users transition from low engagement, and I'll try later to define engagement, to more engagement. And this was a diagram taken from the innovation report uh, leaked last spring. Um, that we want people to get to be a registered user and eventually become subscribers. And once they're subscribers, we'd like it if they stayed subscribers. 
Um, and so that's a problem that you might like to predict, meaning you would like to predict for a given individual which of those individuals are at risk and what are the risky behaviors? What are the things that people do that seem to be leading indicators for people churning? Again, supervised learning is not the same as causal modeling. You can find things that are correlated with churning, but correlation is not causation. However, causation does cause correlation, which means that they're correlated. So we tend to look there. Uh, and then, of course, you'd like to build models that are not only predictive, but interpretable, right? So in the end, you know, whether you're collaborating with uh, a biologist or a CEO or a four-star general or somebody from product, you're going to need to make these machine learning methods somehow interpretable to people. Uh, and so we do that with a lot of help, including from R. Those of you who are trained in R will recognize this as the kind of plot that you make in R, where you try to rank order a set of features that describe, in this case, the way people engage with the website, variously quantified, and try to rank those features based on how much they are, give you predictive power for predicting who's going to stick around. Uh, other problems that we try to work on, oh sorry, and just to be fair, uh, we also do some of this in Python. Here's an example of how you might do it uh, using L1 log uh, regularized logistic regression because you want a sparse model with only a few features. One of the things that we do since L1 tends to, um, if you have two collinear covariates, meaning two features that are almost the same, L1 will choose one and not the other. So to get some sense of robustness and confidence around how strong we think these features are, under cross-validation, we tend to generate a distribution of the weight of these coefficients in order to say, like, do we really believe this, or are there two features and you could choose one or the other? Um, we don't say those words, but we do say error bars. And some of those features are good, and they're green, and some of those features are bad, and they are red. And those sorts of things are very useful for working with people to bring your machine learning into life and get people to obey you to obey the math. Um, there are other problems that involve just straight up operations research. The New York Times, unlike many properties, actually makes physical things, like we make papers, and you have to decide how many papers to go to different places, so there's some fun problems involving optimization and learning at the same time, like somebody has to decide how many copies of the paper are gonna go to Starbucks number 1066 in Tulsa, Oklahoma tomorrow, and that should be data driven. Um, if you'd like to read more about that, there was a nice popular mechanics piece about the New York Times earlier this year. Uh, we also work hard to get to know our readers, and this is you know, an exploratory technique. I hope some of you have uh, seen the video of a nice talk by Dale Kim, um, shown here, trying to use some fancy, no, not trying to, successfully using some fancy math uh, to learn topics associated with different groups of people across the world and what sort of topics engage with different people from different places. Uh, and Dale is very good at getting that to scale. To scale, I should say another thing that we've learned over the last year, thanks to Dale, is that, um, as they say, a prototype is worth a thousand meetings. So if you want somebody to really interpret your machine learning, it's nice to have a chart, it's nice to have a loss function, but if you really want, you know, somebody who's an actual human to understand what you're doing, it's extremely useful to just to just instantiate and flask some little web app that's going to allow somebody to interact with the model and understand the data, and that's hugely useful for getting people to understand what you're doing. Um, in general, our audiences matter. And so one of the things we'd like to understand is we'd like better to understand our audience. Why do we wish to understand our audience? Well, I can do this without violating NDA because it was already leaked. I can tell you that if you look at the income from a couple of years ago for the New York Times, overall, there's actually more income coming from circulation rather than from advertising. Now, that may seem intuitive to you if you're young, but this is actually a new innovation in the history of, of journalism, or I should say, of newspapering, right, the business of journalism. Um, in fact, uh, for most of the history, and let's say history here goes back to 1950, things were really good if you were in advertising. And if you look at just the annual spend of advertising, you can see that like in the 80s and 90s, everybody was flying business class in all of newspapers, and then <laughs> something happened, you know, some combination of Craigslist and Google AdWords and the Book of Faces, and all of the advertisers switched from wasting half of their money but not knowing which half of the money they were wasting <laughs> to directly targeting people in digital frameworks. And that has caused a real shift in business model among newspapers. Um, as Steve Blank likes to say, a startup is a temporary organization in search of a repeatable and scalable, scalable business model. And in that sense, every publisher is now a startup. Right? It's not just Mashable, BuzzFeed. All legacy properties are now in search of a repeatable and scalable business model for the next century. So um, I said that I would talk about engagement. So you might ask, 
given this uh, diversity of business models, or at least the relationship between advertising and forming long-term relationships with readers in the form of subscription relationships, how do we go about defining an engagement and putting engagement as a design principle to use? What else could there possibly be besides clicks? Well, um, one of the things that you hear a lot in New York, New York is a town with lots of media. Um, somebody asked this morning what would happen if there was no finance in New York. Well, you'd have lots of media, fashion, lots of other stuff. There's plenty of media. Um, and there's many media startups that are trying to innovate on the way that we use the fact that journal journalism is delivered digitally better to understand our audience. So one is uh, Chartbeat. Chartbeat CEO is Tony Hale, and there was this great little Twitter fight uh, last year um, where at some point Tony said, actually, it turns out if you look at these two measures of engagement, how people share stuff online and how much time they spend on the website, Tony said, well, we found effectively no correlation between those things. And it was at a time when people were asking, you know, could, should clicks really be the metric? Because we're starting to have the sense that if you just optimize on clicks, bad things happen, that possibly you're doing something that's bad for America, as John Stewart said years ago. Uh, and so many people are thinking about, well, maybe we should be optimizing on something other than clicks. Tony has a startup, which sort of was founded of, under this little JavaScript hack that said uh, you can ping somebody on the browser and see how long they are. And they've built that little JavaScript hack into a whole uh, successful company now, measuring time on page. So Tony has been advocating that time on page is a better measure of engagement. Uh, Jonah Peretti has uh, founded another little company called BuzzFeed, uh, where Jonah has been saying for years that what Jonah can optimize is the way that people share the content. And Jonah has worked with brands to say, we will design content that people want to share. And so Jonah fought back about a month later and said, actually on BuzzFeed, sharing does increase as people spend more time reading. Uh, and of course, there's, it's, you're not going to find the raw data or the analyses here, but you can follow this link and you can see people's reaction on Twitter to these things. So Joan is an example of a CEO with a business model organized around sharing as a measure for engagement. Tony's an example of a CEO with a company organized around time on page as a measure of engagement. There are many different ways that people are thinking about how engagement should be quantified. So if your business model is clicks, engagement is clicks. Right? <laughs> that's the thing that you as a data scientist should be counting because that's what counts. Uh, if your business model is sharing, then what counts is sharing, and you can count that. Uh, if your business model is time on page, now you can count time on page. And in fact, some advertisers are now starting to pay by the time on page rather than click by, rather than by impression or by click. So what if your business model is subscription? Right? If, you're really, if, you, if the majority of your income is coming from subscription relationships rather than advertisement, including display advertisement, how do you go about thinking about how to quantify the user's experience even on a short time scale, like the time scale of one session, and relate it to this idea of long-term stable relationships with people. So now, if you're a data scientist, is a good time to ask yourself this question, what would Netflix do? <laughs> so fortunately for us, uh, Netflix is, has been a little open about that. Uh, and in fact, there was this nice, there's this nice book called Data Scientists at Work. I urge you to check it out. I'm a big fan of chapter one. Uh, but in chapter two, uh, Caitlin Smallwood, uh, who's the vice president of science and algorithms at Netflix, is, is pretty explicit about how they think about engagement at Netflix, which I will remind you is a subscription business. Okay? And she says, one of the things that you might measure is the number of viewing hours. Right? Anybody would say, well, that seems like one measure of engagement, is how long did you spend streaming? This is a key measure of engagement. It's extremely high. So if you're spending time on Netflix, it's correlated with retention. And so she's leading to you to this idea that what matters in your covariate is, is your covariate a leading indicator for the thing that's going to keep you from going out of business? Right? So retention may be difficult to measure just, on, just based on one person's behavior. That is the real KPI, is, is subscription and retention. But there's another KPI that's easy to measure, which is how many hours we're on the page. Let's advance forward down to the next paragraph. We came up with a metric that we call the streaming score. The streaming score is related to, read, a function of, number of hours that a customer streamed, how long they've been with Netflix, where they are, you know, streaming in Latin America is different than the US. Basically what she's telling you is we build a multivariate model and we put all those variables together to get one composite statistic which they call the streaming score. How might they decide which composite of those features is the most useful? Well, what they want is the, ser the way to come, let's say the combination of those individual easy to measure covariates which gives predictive power for predicting retention. So 
So that's a lot of the way we think about engagement, or at least the way I think about engagement uh, for subscription companies in general. If your business model is subscription, machine learning can help you. You can balance the predictive power for the true KPI, for example, retention, with interpretability, because you want a model that's going to be actionable and useful and interpretable and believable by people who do product marketing or other things, by the CEO and everyone else. And it should be based on features which are easy to measure, quick to measure, or both. You'd like to do something like Netflix does, look at somebody who's having one session, learn what is the combination of ways of quantifying that session now that tends to be predictive of the thing that's going to keep you from going out of business. So that's really what we're trying to do at the New York Times. So when I say that I'm trying to build covariates that relate to retention, I can't tell you what the super cool stuff is, but among the super cool stuff is a set of metrics for how people engage with uh, the content during one session, how long they're there, how many times they're there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we try to do this using a variety of methods. You might try to do it using Random Forest. This is a collab collaboration with Boris Chen, who some of you may know through his fantasy football work, all in R. Um, and we've been able to bring R into production. And this was a close collaboration with Boris and the personalization team. Personalization team are the engineers who make sure that the recommendation engine does not fall down. So we have been able to bring R into production. Uh, we do that via Puppet. Puppet's lovely because if you want to include R, you just say include R. If you want to include some R package, you, you can just say R package. Uh, the truth is, though, actually, that in the R package, we actually use Python's command to <laughs> call the R. So it's a bit like having a Hanukkah bush. Uh, we sort of do both. <laughs> um, but the thing that I want you to take home is that <coughs> machine learning can help you think more clearly about engagement. There's an infinite number of ways to define engagement. And even when you start thinking about, oh, well, engagement should be something like number of clicks or number of hours, you still have a parameterized definition, and you're going to have to set those parameters somehow. So there's many things you can choose. You can choose poetry, and I've heard some very rhetorically lovely definitions of engagement. Philosophy, just sort of think abstractly about what the users might be doing. Or you could choose science, and as you may not be surprised, we chose science. So, and in particular, we tried to define the reality. The reality here is some KPI related to subscription, and in our case, retention, becoming a subscriber, and remaining a subscriber. Those are the things you really want to measure, or to predict, right? Sorry, not measure, to predict. Right? So I urge you to think about what is it that you're trying to predict. And by you, I mean your bosses. Right? Like, what is the thing that keeps the CEO at night? And it's probably some figure of merit with units of US dollars. Can you predict that thing from things that are easy to measure? Measure it based on things that are interpretable, uh, observable, easy to measure, quick to measure, or both, and learn a combination of the second that predicts the former. It's a straight up machine learning idea. If you'd like, choose a combination of features, each of which is a type of engagement, but learn from the data what is the type of engagement that actually measures for retention on that product, on that platform, what have you. Um, now, lest you think that science makes everything easy, I want to warn you as a ghost of science past that a lot of my thinking about this has come from my own background in systems biology. So if you look at the literature from systems biology 10 years ago, there's a whole bunch of papers about robustness or other design principles or modularity or other things like that. And you can see rapidly from retracing that literature how people sort of define it in a variety of ways. And then they say, and we found it in this data set. And quickly it devolves into something that looks a lot like amateur baseball statistics. So not just because they're scientists, just because we're scientists, doesn't mean that we know exactly what we're doing. What's nice about predictive analytics is you can be wrong. Right? If you're trying to make a prediction about something, then you can learn some combination of features, each of which may be interpretable, but you can say, look, did I or did I not accurately predict the thing that I wanted to predict? So um, that's essentially what I wanted to say, except for the major punchline, which is we're hiring in data science. And I'd love to hear from you, um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. And if you'd like to know more about any things that I've said, uh, I've put together a list of URLs at this short URL. Thank you very much. Great. We have 36 seconds. So if you can do if someone asks a question in five seconds, you got it. How many cool features do you need to explain covariance? I mean, we tend to work anywhere between like 50 to 500 dimensions. But I mean, for any given use case, you might want to bring things down to a set that's manageable and interpretable and actionable and things like that. But we start out with the kitchen sink. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yep.